Signalis is a survival horror game developed as a debut project of a two-person studio, Rose Engine, and published in October 2022. I first came across it when the reveal trailer was published, immediately decided that this is my kind of game and wishlisted it, to then buy it for full price shortly after release on Steam. I am putting all this information up front to let you know that, while there is no direct conflict of interest in me covering it, I am about as close to being neutral as my physical body is to the sun. In other words, nowhere close and I have no intentions of shortening the distance. In the game, you take control of LSTR-512, or Elster, an android who woke up on board a spaceship. Short stroll across the vessel informs you that you crashed onto a planet, you can't use the spaceship to fly off, and there should be a second person on board, a human officer. The cryopod is empty aside from a broken keycard, and one of the spacesuits is missing, so Elster ventures out into the unknown to find her co-worker on the alien planet. Oh. This is a flesh hole. It is an entrance in a wall of meat and there is no way forward but through it. And on the other end, a perfectly mundane radio broadcast station. Huh. Hey, I know this book. Isn't that a collection of short stories that was very influential for Lovecraft? The first thing I really need to address regarding this game is its choice of aesthetics, because that's really what grabbed my attention in that trailer a few years back. Because it is frankly immaculate, I'm one of those crazy people who feel fondness for the PlayStation 1 era 3D models and how designers always try to squeeze as much personality out of the five polygons as possible. Signalis takes full advantage of the blurry, somewhat undefined look of those models when showing people and monsters throughout the game, but it also is not afraid to break away from that feeling to slap you with incredibly detailed level design, gorgeous 2D steel shots, or effects like dynamic lighting that would burn your CPU back in the day. And the game also gives you options to put on a CRT filter and enable tank controls if you want to fill the PS1 even more. With the indie scene being full of SNES throwback visuals, not that I'm complaining about that, it really sets the game apart and gives it an instantly recognizable look. Also, as in a certain previous video, I have to know that the mirrors in the game are fully functional. Get bent, high-budget games! I let the music composed by Thousand Eyes and Cicada Sirens playing in the background for this entire video speak for itself. As for the main gameplay loop itself, it is a clear throwback to the first Resident Evil, with some elements of Silent Hill thrown in. You have to scramble around labyrinthian corridors of the Sierpinski facility to gather keys and puzzle pieces to progress forward with a limited 6-slot inventory, but you also have to get up close and personal to stomp on an enemy to keep them down. But not for long, because just like in the first Resident Evil remake, they can get up unless you burn them to a crisp with an item with very limited uses. Of course, it means it has the typical problem of early Resident Evils, where you track back and forth because of limited inventory space. Just kidding, it's not a problem at all, I love that shit, it was made for me! When I first beat our remake, my first thought was, huh, I bet I can do that in one run with no saves, and then did it after a few attempts. While the first run is Byzantine and confusing, knowing exactly where to go, what to do and how to most effectively plan your route there on the second run is incredibly empowering in these games. I love it! And Signalis is certainly no stranger to being cheeky about this and at several instances going, hey, these doors need six keys, are you a bad enough dude to get them all with no time wasted on visiting the save room? Speaking of collecting keys, I really enjoy the variety of puzzles present in this game. One of the primary tools you get in the game is a radio which lets you scan across frequencies and this is the main tool for some of them. Listen in onto safe combinations, play a message to open a box, overload the brain of a psychic enemy, get the absolutely bullshit secret ending you have no way of finding without a guide, you name it. But aside from that, there's also things like a lock you need to pick or a spatial puzzle, things like that. Stuff never felt repetitive and, in a true Tidu fashion, the one time I got stuck was when the answer was staring me right in the face. Combat-wise, the game is fun as well. The enemies are varied and pose unique challenges. It never quite gave me the Resident Evil 7 vibe where I felt I'm fighting the same bastard over and over. You are given some tools that address the most common gripes about the genre. You can still tippy-toe around when aiming and you get a shove instead of shooting if the enemy gets too close. It sounds minuscule, but it makes everything much smoother and faster. There is also a good element of uncertainty to the whole thing. First of all, 
it takes a while for Elster to aim her gun to deal maximum damage. So the game heavily incentivizes getting the drop on enemies and an encounter where you run around dodging while taking pot shots is not just more stressful, but also much more wasteful. And then there's the masterstroke of the fact that the enemies, even when sharing a type, seem to have a randomized pool of hit points. How many bullets do I need to down this bitch? One? Two? Five? You're never quite sure. I beat this game twice and I'm still not certain myself. And combining that with the fact that enemies can get up from the floor if not turned into pemmican, this means there isn't really any peace to be felt when scrambling through the rooms and corridors. Oh yeah, additionally, unlike in many of its predecessors, the game doesn't pause when you pick up items, so getting past enemies to grab something and leave becomes much more stressful. In the video game business, we call this the good shit. But these things only make Signalis a good game. The twin stars that my thoughts have been orbiting around since first starting the game are its world building and storyline. And these two nuclear forces are what elevate Signalis from a good game to one of the best in its chosen genre. The world is presented as a cruel, unwelcoming place even before the inciting incident turned everyone into screaming facsimiles of themselves. The nation of Yusan is a revolutionary government that splintered itself from a vaguely defined empire. But as the war wages on, the motherland imposes more and more draconian laws to keep itself alive. Constant surveillance, banning books or even certain words, jingoistic propaganda exalting military service above art and literature. Rose Engine are based in Hamburg, Germany, and they clearly pulled a lot of ideas on how to portray this police state from the history of their country, with Yusan's flag even being pretty much identical to that of GDR, more widely known as East Germany. I've heard many opinions on how this makes the game's setting feel unique and novel when compared to other horror titles. For me, it felt homely, if that's even the right word. It's like hearing a fairy tale you remembered from your childhood repeated in another language. The same horror stories I've heard as a child, the same narrow corridors of apartment blocks I lived in, transported into the future and painted over with anime brush strokes, but still undeniably familiar. A beautiful dream about another broken and self-contradictory dream. This is also elevated by the type of technology on display. This might be the distant future, but everything runs on magnetic tape, CRT screens and floppy disks. Dubbed cassette futurism by some, it's the kind of vision of the future as seen in things like Alien or Blade Runner, where the assumption was that the technology contemporary to the movie's creators would still be around in the future. This choice might be a love letter to those pieces of media and their oppressive aesthetic or it can be interpreted as a symbol of how this far future landscape is stuck in its own past, unmoving. Going back to undeniable familiarity, this game is rife with references. The devs wear their favorite things and inspirations on their sleeves, not just in terms of gameplay and atmosphere as mentioned above, but also visual design and cinematography. Which, unfortunately, can be a bit distracting if you're a media-poisoned nerd like myself. I do not want to claim that Signalis is anything less than a sum of its parts, it's so much more than that. But when the game uses almost shot-for-shot -shot homages to incredibly influential works like End of Evangelion and Ghost in the Shell, or cites Lovecraft and Chambers, I need to actively suppress my brain from just brushing off these moments as mere references and think about why and how they were used in this story, which is its very own thing. So, uh, yeah, I hope you guys have a long and successful career, but please be more subtle next time, okay? Though credit where it is due, the game is also full of original fun concepts, like all the android or replica models being based on German words for the bird species. As for the story, well, there isn't much I can say in the non-spoilery part. The most I can offer you now is this. The game might seem confusing and disjointed, but it all clicks into place emotionally and narratively in the third chapter. Ideally, I believe you should play this to completion twice because the way it uses symbols, ideas and names is incredibly cohesive and really puts a picture together once you have the truth at the back of your mind. And it is a short game, with my first one being 8 hours and the second one shaving that down to a half. On that note, I will get into heavy, heavy spoilers now. For anyone who wants to avoid them and play the game for themselves, please change your frequency to the one visible on the screen right now. Go play the game and come back later. As for the rest of us, let's jump right in. Oh man, this fucking game. 
All right, so this game needs to be taken apart and put in a different order for me to convey the exact maddening depths I have reached here. I'm going to skip over events as presented in the game and then come back to them to make everything a bit more cohesive. I'm writing all of this under the assumption that you've beaten the game and we are talking about a completed picture, not scattered jigsaw puzzle pieces. Though, looking at the full script now, I realized that there was no way I was going to piece together a clear timeline. Let's start with the literal story of Elster and Ariane, her commanding officer aboard Penrose 512, a survey ship trying to fight habitable or otherwise valuable wards, falling in love over their long journey, only for Ariane to succumb to radiation-induced cancer as the government that sent her there callously wrote her off as an acceptable loss, with words that basically amounted to, uh, yeah, if you didn't find anything yet, just ask your Elster replica to feed you a gun, you're gonna run out of food and your reactor is going to melt down. The hidden additional knife to the gut being that they received this message right after celebrating their 3000 cycles anniversary. Assuming a cycle is equal to a day, that's a little over 8 years of journey. In the end game, you can find Ariane's notes saying that they reached cycle 5000 something, so additional 5 years or more passed before the events of the game even started. And that's not to mention the fact that Ariane's notes depicted symptoms of radiation poisoning even before either of those points. I appreciate how love is portrayed in this game. As with Silent Hill 2, the details are simple enough to not stand in the way of being relatable. Just like you don't need to be a straight man to understand James, I don't need to be a gay robot to understand Elster. But usually, when love is portrayed in a tragedy like this, it's as a starting point for suffering. This is a somewhat understandable narrative trick. It's a feeling so ever-present and widely understood that it can be used as a springboard for theming and other emotions. So we have people aiming for the protagonist's loved ones to hurt them, or bad breakups, or a whole lot of dead wives used as an excuse for a revenge story. Doubly so for LGBT relationships. This is gonna be a tangent, but a few years ago I watched The Danish Girl, a biopic about Lily Elbe, one of the first documented patients of surgical sex reassignment. And one of the key plot points of that movie is her wife being in peril over missing her husband. Except then I googled the real Lily Elbe and that was a fucking lie! Her wife was gay as hell! Anyway, my point being, Elster and Ariane's relationship is never used for anything but portrayal of peace, comfort and genuine warmth, and I think that's neat. One of the most beautiful things in life not warped by the lens of storytelling, what a concept. Let's get back to the game now. Elster's entire journey is one of trying to reach Ariane to fulfill her promise, and her lover's cancer-induced suffering. Problem being... Well, let's try to put this into a bit of a chronological timeline, even if I think it is ultimately more complex than a simple narrative A to B, but there is a chain of events I can link, I believe. I think that the initial events are meant to be taken literally. The ship crash landed somewhere, Alistair woke up and Ariane was gone. There is little indication how much time passed between the last notes left by her and these events. Outside, on a snow-covered planet, there is a mysterious rectangular gate and beyond it, a fleshy hole in the earth, at the bottom of which is a tunnel. At the end of the tunnel, a simple radio room. You return here at the end of the game and Elster notices that the books there belong to Ariane. The photos were of a painting she painted again and again. Then you pick up the king in yellow and the intro starts and... There. Right there. For a split second. A game over screen. This was the death of the original Elster. My running theory being, the ship crashed, Ariane was the first to leave and wanted at least to see the new world before dying and cross the gate. Whatever was in there picked up on her thoughts, but didn't understand them, for despite its power it was completely alien, integrating her thoughts, memories and wishes into an ocean where I ends and we begin. And thus, the events of the game start. Ariane is bioresonant, which is basically the game's term for a certain form of telepathy. There are notes of her being suspected of having those abilities. A book you can find at the end of the game, banned by the government, describes it as being attuned to a music not everyone can hear, and that there are individuals so strong in it as to warp reality, one of them being the Empress who took mankind into the stars. Ariane was ostracized by society, in part due to not fitting in due to growing up in a remote radio station with her mom, in part due to looking weird due to her albinism, and finally because she was obsessed with art and music and not being a drone for society's sake. As if she was attuned to the beauty in the world, while everyone else's radio wasn't even functional. 
Thus, I believe Ariane is bioresonant on the same level as the Empress and the great revolutionary that started the rebellion. But rather than discover her talents, she decided to leave the solar system altogether, making that less than a footnote on the pages of her person until she met something as attuned to it as her, but misunderstanding everything else about her. I fully believe there is an intangible alien being at play here, not just an illusion of one. In Adler's words, it's as if everything was taken apart and then put back again by someone who doesn't understand how it works. While not directly cited as an inspiration, this reminds me a lot of Stanislav Lem's Solaris, which works on a very similar concept. Go read that book if you haven't, it's great. And so we get to the first chapter. Synchronicitat. Synchronicity, the phenomenon of things occurring at the same time, or, in Jungian psychology, the coincidental occurrence of events and especially psychic events, such as similar thoughts in widely separated persons or a mental image of an unexpected event before it happens, that seem to relate but are not explained by any conventional mechanism of causality. Relating both to the time loop the game takes place in, the work of a higher force, and the fact the game makes you think the plot takes place on Lang, and that Elster from the beginning and this Elster are the same, despite carrying different photos, all at the same time. The chapter takes place in the Sierpinski facility on Lang, where Ariane was supposed to be stationed if she was not accepted for the Penrose program. My belief is that this is because this might have been the final thoughts in the mind of dying Ariane. What if she didn't go on Penrose? What if she was assigned to Sierpinski? But at the same time, this is that facility physically. I am unsure if Penrose was pulled back into the solar system's orbit and crashed into Lang on the other side of the planet, or if there is a second gate that they found that made the being connect the two distant places in the universe. On one hand, all the Elster units were based on a decommissioned unit from a Penrose program, and it would explain why the memory and drive of all Elsters align with the original one, who was humanized beyond her function by Ariane, ignoring the warning notes given to her by the government on how to avoid persona degradation. On the other, there was never an Elster unit deployed to Sierpinski, so they probably just decommissioned another Elster, not 512, and her mind got imprinted onto all the others by the being. Ultimately, I think that any distinction is moot, but it is fun to think about. And I think that people that actually lived on Sierpinski were real and affected by these events, given that they had prior lives and are clearly confused by the events. Fun fact, the Sierpinski triangle is a fractal shape composed of other triangles, which can be infinitely scaled up or down. Think of an infinitely repeating Triforce. A very ironic name for a facility to be stuck in a time loop for sure. We find Elster in a bathroom, holding a photo that is similarly degraded, but clearly showing another person, Alina Sio. A girl looking very similar to Ariane, aside from the hair color, as underlined in a letter from her mother, the photo that the latter developed when working at her aunt's photo store that got her thinking. Who is this girl? Will I be as happy as her when I join the military? Is that a better life than the current one? We never find Alina in the game, but I do have a theory of her that goes as follows. She is real and a contemporary of Ariane's, but older than her. The photo was developed by request of the mother of the Ito sisters, as her name is also visible among the ones listed on the real undamaged photo. And after her military duty, Alina was assigned to Sierpinski, like Ariane was supposed to be working in the mines. Once the bioresonance shenanigans hit the facility, her mind is slowly overwritten by Ariane's, trying to find Elster despite such a replica never being deployed to Lang, and she even mentions in her last journal that her hair started turning white. A higher power forcing a connection between two strangers that looked similar by coincidence. Synchronicitat. We also find the radio module and the first plate for a later puzzle in a box that belongs to her. And the end of this section is a door with six symbols, into which we have to put in five keys corresponding to different elements. We'll put a pin on that for the moment. One thing I cannot figure out about the higher levels of Sierpinski is, what is the censored word? The name of the topmost level. It is filled with classrooms and observation rooms attached to them, so my first instinct is education, but if that were the case, then the leaflet describing the facility would call it an educational vocational school, which seems redundant. Or maybe it was academia, censored both because of the revolution's anti-elitist sentiments and or Ariane's bad memories of the school. Academic vocational school, teaching both theory and practice. It still seems like a stretch, but it's the best I've got. 
The one last thing I want to address before we delve further is the administration room in which we fight our first Colibri unit, the most bioresonant of replicas. We can shoot her and her illusions until we get her, or we can tune the radio to specific frequencies to cause a feedback loop that kills her. In other words, bioresonance works on the same wavelengths as a radio. Resonance itself, in physics, is the phenomenon of increasing a vibration's amplitude by playing another sound of a similar frequency. This secret tool will help us out later. The second thing of note in that room is the painting of an island. This is Isle of the Dead, or the Totten Insel, by Arnold Bocklin. It was not named by him, but by the owner of the original copy of it, and Bocklin specifically refused to give any public explanation of the meaning of the painting. Over his life, Arnold made five different versions of this picture, always slightly different, but always depicting a ferryman and a passenger approaching a still Syrian island. It's also the painting that Ariane was painting again and again aboard Penrose, and it can serve as another metaphor of the time loop. The details shift, but the picture is still the same. It's a shame Bocklin only painted 5 of those and not 6. That way it would fit into the overall symbolism of the game better, as the number 6 is all over it. I'm totally not setting up something for 50 paragraphs down when you completely forget I even mentioned this painting. Anyway, this is all I want to sink my teeth into in this chapter. Let's ride the elevator down to the mines and get to the second chapter, liminalitat or liminality. Once again, this is a term that occurs in psychology and anthropology. From Latin limen, which means a threshold, it is the state of ambiguity which exists in the middle stage of certain events or rituals, such as a rite of passage or a society-wide revolution, during which the particular individual or group no longer holds its pre-ritual status, but has not yet attained the status it will hold when the ritual has been completed. Or in other words, it's about being on the border between one state and another, like in this chapter, where we delve into a mid-filled nightmare of nowhere, as we transit from the previous assumption that this horror was a cosmic tale of people in Sierpiński delving too deep, to a psychological horror of Ariane's ailing mind amplified by said cosmic horror. The chapter is the connection point between the two, but it is also neither of these things. There are quite a few things I'm unsure of regarding this section. I don't know if the boss you help is a kill, a cage filled with hands, is meant to be anything specific. The previous boss becomes a common enemy later on, so I didn't even mention it, but this one is unique. It might just be a fucked up little guy, I don't know. Similarly, I don't know what to think of the room you start in, a sort of funeral home for replicas. I don't see this kind of sentimentalism being allowed in a utilitarian hellscape, but it might as well be the first indication of us delving into Ariane's mind. She did consider Elster to be a person, after all, and it might be extended to all replicas. One fun little thing you can find before the boss fight is a garbled note on a wall which, if you've ever seen warning signs posted around sites of nuclear waste disposal, alludes towards the nature of the illness that killed all the gestalts and made the replicas morph into enemies we fight throughout the game. Though, obviously, a society that can construct nuclear reactors for spaceships knows what radiation is, and the note from Adler at the end of the game even dismisses radiation as a possibility. So again, I think it is not physically radiation, but the being correcting every Gestalt and replica to match the one human it came in contact with, Ariane. Gestalts were even blasted to the point where nothing but shadows remained where they were. That's not radiation poisoning, that's an image from the aftermath of Hiroshima. Similarly, I don't think the mid corridors are the physical body of the being. I don't think it even has a body, at least not a solid and perceivable one. I think it's filling out the gaps with cancer due to Ariane's state, and it itself is, well, something that resonates. A wave, a reverberation. We should make the gate and the gigantic hole in the ground less of a portal and more of an amplifier or antenna. I don't really have much supporting evidence for this claim, but it is the vibe I'm getting, so take that as you will. Hell, with this approach, there might not even be a cosmic horror after all, just a dying mind capable of world-altering signals put into an ancient equivalent of a vuvuzela. But for consistency's sake, I will keep referring to the phenomenon, whatever it might be, as the being. The symbols on plates collected are the same as the ones on the door to the surgery room in the first chapter, as well as propaganda posters of the six different wards in the solar system. As there will be one more piece to this in the next chapter, I'll hold off on discussing that for now.
past the door, Elster crawls out of the hole that the whole journey started in and walks past the gate and injured Adler to reach the Penrose, surrounded by corpses of other Elster units, implicitly her own past attempts. It's interesting how the ship is the same but the landscape completely changed, from snow-covered and windy to a bright red desert. I do believe that this is the same place, but reflected in a Silent Hill kind of way, warped by the perception of Ariane. After all, she did dream of embracing a lover on the bright red desert of Keats, until a sandstorm reduced them to nothingness. Maybe even now she remembers that dream, and she remembers Elster. Just like in The King in Yellow, or at least the titular play implied in the short stories by Chambers, the two acts of the story have a completely different tone. The first one relatively mundane, with eerie undertones, one that a person could go through and think, oh, well, I can believe that happened. And a second act, the one responsible for driving people mad in the stories, telling stories of black stars and Hastur, of powers beyond humanity. And just like in Chambers' short stories, the end of Elster's story is abrupt. She is unable to open the Penrose, losing her arm in the process, unable to fulfill her promise. That is, if you are unaware that this electronic play has a third act. Gestaltzerfall, or shape decomposition, is a psychological phenomenon where delays in recognition are observed when a complex shape is focused on for a long time. It seems to decompose into its constituting parts. In other words, if you read or hear the same term over and over, that term becomes meaningless. Say dog a hundred times in quick succession and it starts to feel alien. Alluding possibly both to the endless repetition of the cycle and how trying to make any sense of it is pointless, and the fact that Elster can now see the picture painted by Ariane's mind for what it is, memories breaking at the seams. This chapter brings us to Rotford, the planet that Ariane grew up on, though unlike with Sierpiński, there are no new confused people here, so it's probably safe to assume it's a memory reconstruction and not the real place getting brain blasted. We already discussed bits and pieces of revelations from this chapter before, so let's just get straight to symbolism. Each symbol has assigned an element and a planet, and to each planet there is a tarot card assigned. I will only discuss the upright meaning of tarot. It doesn't always fit, but as a reversed arcana always means the opposite of the normal meaning, please take that into consideration as we go on. Let's take them in order. A triangle, earth, balance, leng, death. Death, despite its rather scary name, is in the middle of the tarot deck. It symbolizes change, new beginnings, letting go of the past, a transformation. I assume most likely because Ariane still thought of Lenk as the other direction her life might have gone, another new beginning after leaving Rotfront. And also I find it quite interesting that, according to her medical files, this is the planet of her birth. So it would be a return in a way, a pendulum swinging back into balance. As for Earth, well, it is home to mining facilities. A circle, water, flesh, rotfront, moon. Rotfront is literally a moon, covered in snow as seen in memories of school and train rides. The arcana of moon symbolizes illusions, confusion, secrets, and as we see in this chapter, there was a spy around and a generally anti-government sentiment going on. Oh yeah, and Ariane getting constantly bullied and misunderstood. Two lines. Air. Knowledge. Vignetta tower. The tower symbolizes disaster, sudden change, chaos. It's the cradle of humanity from which the species originated in this world, and was destroyed in the Revolutionary War. We can also assume most of these mind imprints were located there, as the file on the Elster unit also mentions them getting destroyed along with a facility containing them, a sort of an archive perhaps, tracking with the theme of knowledge. And the posters depict skyscrapers as well. Star. None. Eternity, Heimat, Star. The birthplace of the revolution and the Star Arcana represents hope, rejuvenation, faith. I would assume that Eternity would symbolize the revolutionary government being in place as long as Ariane can remember, and she does not dream of it, nor does it have an element assigned to it. I would assume that anything regarding the world is of utmost state secrecy, and Ariane is not even capable of imagining it as a physical space, just the symbol of the government at large. Fire, hexagon, sacrifice, buyan, the sun. 
The location of the Imperial Palace hanging above the poisonous clouds, the Sun Arcana symbolizes happiness, truth, optimism, success. And, as nation's propaganda tells us, it will burn. A sacrifice needed for peace. And if the Forbidden Book is true, the Empress of it was powerfully bioresonant and likely knew a lot about how the world truly works because of that. A different triangle. Gold, love, kids, lovers. This one confuses me a bit. There is not much in the game about kids, it's a planet covered by red deserts, and the arcana of lovers means, of course, love, union, romance, harmony. But why would this word be associated so universally with all that if neither Ariane nor Elster were there? For, you see, this is not some solar system that so happens to also have humans in it. It's ours. The planet names are apparently from Russian folklore, but man, am I not getting into that. But look at the orrery, surrounded by poisonous clouds, Buyan or Venus, the destroyed homeworld of humanity, Vignetta or Earth, the outlier of the system, Leng or Pluto, the terraformed cold moon, Rotfront, or most likely Europa, the other moon with the view of a gas giant rings, Heimat or most likely Titan, and finally the planet covered in red deserts, Kids or Mars, planet commonly associated with desire passion and energy. I think it's also worth noting that the Earth key is initially blank and you need to imprint a found pattern onto it, just like Ariane's thoughts are materialized onto Lang. And the gold key is found in a video recording described as something that shouldn't be here, just like the love and red deserts associated with that element should not be there at all. The number 6 is all over the game. 6 item slots, 6 keys, 6 significant words on the orrery. You need to stop Falk in the face 6 times with her own spears. And the number associated with the lover's card in tarot? 6. Which, you know, I'm sure Resident Evil 1 and Chris having 6 inventory slots had a role here, but for a game centered around love between two people, this seems like a very deliberate choice. In the Kabbalah, the sphere Tiferet, symbolizing harmony and beauty, associated with the heart, is also the sixth sphere. Why am I speaking of the Kabbalah all of a sudden? Well, you see, there was one other thing puzzling me. Why do they always go for the right eye in this game? Well, in the Kabbalah, it is associated with the node of Bina, or understanding, the intellect allowing us to make sense of the world. And the three characters that lose it all do so right before reaching a horrible realization of some sorts. Isa realizes that this world is not real and she will never meet her sister, not to mention that they are both long dead and melts into nothing. Adler talks with Elster before the gate and, shortly after that, puts the pieces together on how everything is taken apart and broken, then embracing his hatred of everything regarding the situation. And then he stabs Elster in the right eye, just as she is about to confront Ariane and learn about her condition from all the notes aboard the Penrose. Though, considering my previous statement on how I said the opening of the game is to be taken literally, I would probably say that this final version of the Penrose is distorted to further empathize how it became a death trap. I think the material Penrose is covered in snow and has tumors covering the cryopod, where the body of Ariane lies, but perhaps her mind is not there anymore at that point. The soldier in the photo probably just got the all war injury though. Am I reaching too hard here? Probably, and that goes for the entire video. But goddamn, I appreciate that the game got me going so hard as to link it to my other recent obsessions. Yuri and Barbara, if you're here, feel free to tell me I'm an idiot in the comments below. Anyway, let's get to the final few theories here before going back to the others. I think the King in Yellow served as a structural inspiration more than a narrative one. Aside from the two-act nature of the fictional play, what I find really important is the fact how the reality is described in those short stories. Haster is a king, a god, a planet, a city. Carcosa is on a faraway planet or a location on Earth in several different countries. It is far away and right next to our characters. And similarly, in Signalis, I think this kind of multi-thread approach to truth applies. The story takes place on the faraway planet, on Lenk, in Ariane's dying dream. Ariane is herself, and her past, and Alina Sio, losing her and teeth, and eternally as on the anniversary with Elster. Elster is Elster, and Elster, and Falk, and Elster. All of these are true at the same time. As for the endings, there are three main ones. Elster can't fulfill her promise and leaves to die, curled in a ball on the red desert. 
Elster reaches Ariane, who doesn't remember her, and the replica dies, wanting to just spend more time with her beloved. And finally, Elster fulfills her promise to Ariane, killing her and slumping lifelessly next to the cryopod. Unfortunately, the position in which she dies in the latter two implies this will prolong the cycle, as this is the exact position you find the body you take body parts from at the beginning of chapter 3. Hi there, Editor Tidu here. Looking through the footage of this game, I couldn't shake a certain feeling. Why is Ariane's face covered in band-aids and such? These are for lacerations, not poison running through your body that makes you spit out your teeth. And then I realized something. We do see Alina Sio and how she looks, just once, right here. So yeah, I think this explains why none of the endings stop the cycle. Even after all of this, Elster never truly reached Ariane. Fucking grim. And there is a secret ending, requiring you to locate three keys in specific locations with a radio tuned into the right frequency. As if these keys did not exist until you resonated with Ariane's thoughts. Also, fun fact, if you turn on the radio in the final room of the game, it just brain blasts you regardless of frequency. So I guess it's safe to say bioresonance shenanigans are going on. Though, I'll be honest, I use the guide as locating this apparently involves slow scan TV images, and I wouldn't ever think of that. If skipping those steps made me miss anything, sorry. The key of love is located in the isolation ward, as Ariane's and Elster's love bloomed in the isolated environment of Penrose. The flavor text talks of pleasant memories of time spent with Elster. The key of eternity marked with the symbol of Heimath is located on the copy of Saturn Devouring His Son by Francesco Goya. I would assume this relates to the feeling of betrayal, how the glorious revolution colossally sent her off to die the revolution eating its own children. The flavor text asks why do you keep searching for answers if it will all end in heartbreak? After all, even if a perfect solution can be reached and both of them saved, they will still be spat out into the world that had them killed. The final key is the key of sacrifice, located on the stack of white books next to the forbidden tome discussing bioresonance in mystical terms. I think pretty much all but confirming white-haired Ariane's powers. The flavor text speaks of a star falling to earth and causing a cataclysm in downright biblical terms. I think in relation to the sheer scope of the power of bioresonance and the being, whatever it may be. Collect the three items and in the radio room you can open a safe. Oh yeah, you also need the code from the radio from the very beginning of the game. If it has a meaning, I was unable to decipher it. Inside it is a white lily, a houseplant seen in Ariane's memories, including aboard the Penrose, symbolizing purity and rebirth, and also a key plot point in The Mask, one story from The King in Yellow. Elster puts it upon a pedestal and collapses. There are five other pedestals, all empty, and five other dead Elsters. They surround a coffin, or perhaps the cryopod, within which is a thing. And after a fade to black, we see Elster and Ariane dancing aboard the destroyed Penrose, with a red eye in the sky watching over the ship. The five other Elsters I am unsure of. There is the original and three endings, but we are missing one. But hey, remember Arnold Bocklin? Yeah, he painted a sixth version of the Totten Insel, titled The Isle of Life. Same island, completely different tone. As such, I believe this is the sixth ending in a way. Being able to connect with the being, portrayed physically as the red eye from the rot front, an atmospheric phenomenon well known to Ariane from her home, that was assigned mystical or even a political meaning to actually give them a form of satisfying closure. They're not in the physical world, it takes place on the red desert, but they are reunited for the last time. I became we. Also, one of the copies of Totten Incel was destroyed, which can account for one of the dead Elsters not having an in-game presence, but even I think that's stretching. Still gonna mention it though. And that's all I was able to think of. There's still bits missing though. I have negative knowledge on music, so I can't comment on pieces chosen or the tone used for the original soundtrack. I have no idea what the game's logo symbolizes, despite it having a physical presence in the game itself. I also have no way of investigating all the writing in the game that is not in German or English. While I do have a rudimentary understanding of the former, nothing really groundbreaking stood out to me in flashes of text and cutscenes. And I am not even touching bird symbolism or if the number 512 has any meaning. I couldn't find anything I would call a clear connection without a link so tangential it might as well be astrology. That's right, I'm picky about which schools of mysticism I do and do not respect. Fuck you, this is my show. 
Anyway, let's get back to the people who dodged two-thirds of this video. <laughs> Alright, now that we're all here... Uh, honestly, what is even there to say at this point? Good game. Great game. If anyone asks you for absolute classics of survival horror, this is already among them. No contest. If you've just heard me ramble, or just looked at the length of the part of this video we skipped, you know that there are staggering depths to this game on top of being very fun to play. This is a contender for my game of the year 2022, and the only reason I'm not handing out that imaginary statuette yet is because I also bought Pentiment and I'm sinking my teeth into that next. This was supposed to be a 15 minute review and fucking look at me now. Signalis is available on all stationary platforms contemporary to its release and costs 20 bucks or equivalent thereof. I bought it for full price on principle and I do not regret my choice one bit. If there are any closing statements I'd like to make other than a sales pitch, well, there are two. One, I wholeheartedly hope that this level of passion both for the medium of games and art outside of it, interlinking them in a single work, will become the standard and not an exception in the future. Two, more games with this aesthetic, please. Not in the sense of the setting or retrofuturism, but just give me lovingly created low-poly models and crisp sound design. The boomers got their turn, now it's millennial dipshit nostalgia time. <sighs> Last video of the year 2022, glad to have you here. Man, this was not what I was planning to end on. Believe it or not, I had two other ideas in the pipeline, but the universe decided that good games are still being made. Shocking, I know. This video was made possible thanks to the general support of our Patreon backers, now visible on the screen. Warm, heartfelt thanks to all of them believing in my pretentious ass this much. I'm gonna slow down in 2023. I also have a project on the side that will produce like six hours long video if it pays off. No promises, but if I die before this year ends, that project is why. Happy New Year!